So um, going back to 2009, I was doing my Bachelor's of Science at University of Toronto. Um, and I was studying uh, a specialist in human biology and major in neuroscience. And sort of as I was coming to the end of my undergraduate studies, I was trying to figure out you know, which career path I was going to take next. Um, all along, I knew I wanted to be in medicine, and like a lot of my peers, going to medical school was one of my priorities. So I believe it was my fa a few of family friends came over uh, for dinner one night, and they said, hey, you should look into the PA program. Sounds pretty new and exciting. And um, so I looked into the physician assistant program, and um, and it was very neat. The you know it was very new, and so that part was there. But then I googled and sort of researched some of uh, the USPAs and how the profession had developed there over the years. And I realized the more I researched and got to know what physician assistants were doing and were capable of, um, the more it sort of aligned with my career goals. Like it would, I would be able to practice medicine in a very short, shorter, relatively short period of time. Um, you know, I also uh, could switch subspecialties, let's say, if I wanted to change things up and, you know, stimulate, um, stay stimulated in different ways. Um, and then also because it was very new to the healthcare system at that point, I thought it was very cool and, ch and exciting, really, to be part of um, an innovative uh, profession in the, in the Canadian healthcare system. Great. And to people who don't know, how would you describe what a PA is? So that really depends who's asking me that question. Um, over the years, I've been asked, as many of us have been, by various people, whether they're patients or students or just innocent bystanders. And I find that the way I answer that question is very different for each group. Um, so for the students, it's a lot more inspirational, you know, trying to tell, show what a PA is and what we're able to do as physician assistants. Um, and then to innocent bystanders, I try to keep it brief because they may or may not know. Um, and if they're if they sound interested, then for sure I'm, uh, you know, I go into it in a little bit more detail. Um, and for patients, I, I try to highlight the role that PAs play in their care. So some of the gaps that we're able to fill uh, in their care and how it's relevant to them. That's my approach in trying to figure in trying to explain what the a PA is. Um, However, my you know, overall definition is that physician assistants are medically trained professionals that practice medicine under, under certain delegated tasks based on their skills and competencies uh, with a pretty wide scope of practice. What is the ideal PA to you? Um, an ideal PA to me has four main skill sets. Um, number one is clinical, um, strong clinical acumen. Uh, number two, someone who's reliable and dependable. Uh, three, someone who's adaptable. And fourth, someone who's a health advocate. So just to explain a little bit more um, what I mean by those. So, I mean, it goes without saying that having strong clinical background and, no and medical knowledge makes you a very good and efficient PA. If you're keen on gaining uh, skills and learning about new things and keeping up to pace with advancements in medicine and what have you, I think clinically you're a very strong PA and you can deliver uh, healthcare with that. Uh, so that's, in my opinion, is very important. Secondly, someone who's reliable and dependable, and I think that skill in our profession is that much more important because we're working with physicians and allied healthcare and nurses and many other people within the healthcare team. That it's that it's it's that much more crucial that you know we're looked upon as somebody who's reliable and and can be that uh, you know person that we can depend on within the team. Um, Thirdly, I, the reason I chose adaptable is because um, things are changing, our role is changing, and as UPAs get more and more experienced in the particular work field that they do, um, they're taking on more responsibilities, and by all means, they're more than capable of doing so. So I think if you're adaptable to changes and you have an open mind with regards to that, I think that's a pretty good skill to have. Um, and lastly, and I think that's actually one of the most important, is uh, being a health advocate. So if you're a patient advocate, listening to your patients, able to advocate for them, provide uh, patient-centered care, um, I think we as PAs can fill a very crucial gap in this healthcare system. You work in surgery now. Did you know this as a second year PA student? I did not. 
So um, while I was going through um, my clinical rotations, I sort of just kept a pretty open mind about what to expect, and I wanted to learn as much as possible from the different different uh, rotations that I was doing. And um, it was sort of closer to the very end that I started gathering my thoughts and putting it together as to what I enjoyed and what I did not. And uh, I really liked internal medicine because I really liked the acuity of the medicine and how sick the patients were and how stimulating that environment was. Um, and then I thought about it and I also liked some of the practical hands-on skills that I was able to polish through my emergency medicine rotation and family medicine, like suture lacerations and um, you know incision and drainage and things like that. And so when it came down to applying for jobs and uh, looking at different uh, positions that I was interested in, now that I think about it, surgery was actually a really good fit because it offered a bit of both. You know, it had the inpatient care, the um, clinical side of things that I enjoyed, and also the practical component, uh, for example, assisting in the operating room or um, doing some procedures on the, on the ward, for example, wound care and ostomy care, and still being able to see consults in the emergency department. So I think, uh, for me, it was a really good fit. Uh, surgery was a really good fit, uh, but I wouldn't have known that had I really... Um, kept an open mind and tried to learn and figure out what it is that I liked and I didn't. And can you describe a typical week in the life of a PA in surgery? So, so on a daily basis, uh, I'm involved, I'm pretty much managing the inpatient ward. Um, that wasn't the case when we were initially hired, but now with the uh, establishment of medical directives, which are pretty comprehensive, I'm able to manage the inpatient ward uh, with minimal assistance from uh, the residents. So that's on daily basis, that's an ongoing thing that involves rounding with the residents, liaising with the nurses and the interprofessional and allied healthcare on the floor. So that's that part of my job is uh, um, more or less the same on daily basis. And if I was to um, look at my schedule on a weekly basis, I have two OR days. And in the operating room, um, I'm either uh, first or second surgical assist. Um, you know, it's, it's cool, and I get to sometimes open and close and prep and drape and sort of overlook the procedure that way. Um, two, or, two days a week are outpatient clinic days, and there I'm seeing consoles, um, you know, side to side with the residents and reviewing with staff as well. Um, and then my uh, one day a week is a bit of a catch-up day. And I free up a few hours to either catch up on some of the work that's, that needs to be done uh, for my inpatient uh for my inpatients, and also, um, you know, some of the research projects and the academic projects that I take on, I, I use a few hours uh, on that day to, to get through some of that work. Mm -hmm. And has this changed over time as you gain more knowledge and autonomy? It has. So when we first started uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital, and that was 2012, um, we weren't really sure what uh, was expected of us. You know, the, our, our staff or the uh, supervising physicians are very, very supportive and wanted to see this profession grow, but we hadn't established our niche, per se, um, uh, in general surgery. Um, but I find that now that I look back to the five or plus years that I've been there, I see my role as having three tiers, essentially. So one of them is the clinical, um, which I've sort of touched on, and uh, second is academic. Uh, we're very actively um, teaching the PA students, the medical students, and even some of the residents. Now that we've been there for this many years and we provide that continuity of care, we sort of know what the different physicians' preferences are, how certain things are managed, uh, more so even than the residents. So we play that critical role in uh, teaching the residents. Um, and then the last uh, piece is the research piece. And I think you know, working with physicians that have a pretty strong research background, um, I'm able to take on some of those projects that I'm doing currently. And uh, so the three tiers to my role that I see at Mount Sinai now are the clinical, academic, and research. No, that, that was good. And um, any tips for PA students aspiring to work in surgery? So, uh, first and foremost, I think you just need to really have an open mind. Um, and, you know, if you come across your surgery rotations and you really like the environment or you like uh, some of the things you got to see and do, I would cons I would recommend that uh, you do maybe a elective in a surgery. 
preferentially in a place that you like to get hired or that are very accepting to PAs so that you can see and get a feel for what the profession would look like. So I think that's one of the things. Um, and then also, uh, you know, if you have some of the skills that I mentioned earlier, you know, being able to work within a team, uh, being a, very, a reliable um, member of the team and uh, having a keen eye for learning and being adaptable, I think some of those skills uh, would make you a pretty good candidate for a surgery PA. My interest in research is uh, around health promotion. Uh, so I believe, uh, um, you know, PAs play a really important role in being patient advocates and, and health advocates, essentially. And uh, we have uh, we have a lot to offer and a lot to do. And um, I think there are many, very many different. There are many uh, um, current processes and current clinical uh, frameworks that can be modified uh, and improved to improve patient outcomes. Uh, a lot of work can be done around patient safety. So my, and I'm always looking for opportunities and ways to kind of improve patient safety and quality of care that we deliver. So overall, a lot of the projects that I've done to date are around quality improvement. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about, we've done a number of research projects over the years, but I'll talk about two that we're currently doing right now. One of them is for um, our colorectal surgery patients. So I, I actually practice uh, with colorectal surgery and breast surgery. Those are the two areas. Um, I'll talk about one project for each that we're doing right now. Um, so for our colorectal surgery patients, we have a uh, mobile app that we've developed as a discharge monitoring tool, tool sorry, um, to support patients after they've been discharged from the hospital. There's a lot of evidence that uh, surgery patients are discharged and they're not really sure about discharge instructions and they feel anxious about their recovery at home and they have a lot of questions and, um, and anxiety really about if they, if they should be expecting certain things, what's normal, what's abnormal. So we've developed a uh, discharge mobile app. It's a monitoring system that essentially uh, checks in virtually uh, with patients once they're home. Um, so we've developed something called a daily health check. It's a survey and it asks questions around some of the similar questions that we ask when they're inpatient, like how is your pain, how is your nausea, are you able to eat, um, do you have any problems with your incisions, any problem uh, with your wounds and stomas and so on. So it has a pretty comprehensive uh, questionnaire and some of the outcomes that and data that we're gathering is based on the quality of recovery uh, 15 scale so which is a validated scale um, validated score sorry uh, so so that so the patients fill out that survey every single day that they're home for the first 14 days and I look at the answers to those surveys and if everything is a-okay then they get a check mark and they get a little progress report at the very end of the survey uh, but if there is something wrong or there is you know red flag responses for example they have a fever all of a sudden their wound is leaking some stuff um, or their ostomy has totally blocked up and they feel nauseous. Like we have some built in uh, checks in the app. And so if the answer with that response, then uh, I see that on my dashboard on the provider side, and which is also encrypted and secured. Um, and then I'm able to call them and say, hey, how are you doing? If there's any feedback, I might be able to provide over the phone. I do that. Um, or if I think they need to come into clinic because there's something like a small wound infection that I can address and they can bypass the emergency department where they'd have to stay eight hours to be seen, uh, then I'm able to offer that sort of uh, service as well. Okay, go ahead. So for this project, we actually did a pilot study which we completed and it showed very positive results. Patients loved it. They loved that sort of uh, being able to connect with the surgical team who knows them quite well, who knows what procedure they had and can provide that uh, follow-up. Um, and right now we're doing a randomized control trial, which we're very excited about. We're sort of half, almost close to the end of it. And so far we've seen pretty promising results that uh, it not only does it benefit the patients, it also um, reduces some bounce backs to the ER and readmission, so it's beneficial to the system as well. Uh, so and we're very excited about it. So that's our first project. And then um, the second project that we just started, uh, which also we're very excited about, is for our breast surgery patients. So just to give a little bit of background, um, most of our breast surgery patients, especially the ones with uh, mastectomies, like 
that have mastectomies and ancillary node dissections. They have a JP, a Jackson Pratt uh, drain placed under the incision. And the purpose of that drain essentially is to evacuate some of this uh, fluid that builds up as part of healing. Um, so we're preventing any seromas or hematomas. And uh, ultimately like wound complications. So but we find that, at least it's our clinical impression, that a lot of patients come back to the emergency de department because these drains are not working well, or they're blocked, or they're not um, being evacuated or milked properly. Um, and, uh, you know, either they go to the emergency department because they're anxious about now the swelling and the leakage around the wound, um, or they call their physician or the surgeon's office to have a, have a look. Um, we're trying to improve that for the patients and improve the patient outcomes by introducing a JP evacuating device. So essentially it's a plastic device, it's a very small device that um, anchors onto the JP drain and it milks, essentially strips the tubing, clearing any clot or anything, any debris that may have clogged the tubing. So by doing so, we're hoping to evacuate uh, any seromas or hematomas or any liquid that may have been built up under the incision and uh, preventing wound complications and wound-related uh, unscheduled visits to the emergency department or the family physician. Um, so we're excited about it. It's uh, shown to work in other settings, uh, especially in America. And uh, so far, we're very early on into our um, randomized sort of uh, project that we're doing, where some people are getting the drain device and some people are not. Um, and we will keep you in the loop uh, to p keep you posted on how things turn out. So what do you enjoy about research? Um, I like, uh, so I enjoy research because I think it's challenging and it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. We're thinking outside the box and, uh, um, you know, problem solving and, you know, you, you have a topic or an idea that you're excited about and when you're uh, gathering information and trying to um, do the research and design the project and actually execute the research, I think it's very good and challenging uh, for me and, and I enjoy that. And I think over time, uh, as I've done more and more projects, I've actually built that into my ro role as well. So I, I, I thoroughly enjoy that. The other thing um, is, is uh, nice about research is to really see that patients benefit from your ideas. Some of the things that you bring to the table or the processes and the frameworks that you're changing to see that the, benef the patients benefit first and foremost, but also the organization that you're working um, in also benefits and, and people see the value that you're adding uh, and the value that your ideas are bringing, um, that's very gratifying. And the other thing I obviously want to touch on is to be able to share uh, my knowledge and sort of the projects and work that I've done with my peers, for example, at the Kappa conferences, uh, is also fulfilling. And to be recognized year over year uh, for some of the research work that I've done is uh, definitely encouraging. What awards have you won? So for the last few years, we've been winning first place uh, for original research at the Kappa Post for Presentations. Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, what are the benefits of participating or conducting research? Um, there, there are a lot of benefits for uh, conducting research. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about some general and then also what's relevant to us as PAs. So we know that research is sort of the platform where we learn uh, about advancements in medicine and, you know, a lot of the... Um, inventions and the futures of medicine, you know, research either proves or disproves certain ideas. So, and that's where, you know, professionals and leaders really in medicine, that's their platform of communicating. So I think, you know, um, once we're researching and publishing and sharing our knowledge, we're joining many other leaders in medicine and, and really paving the way uh, of how um, PA role is seen in the healthcare system. So I think that's a benefit of conducting and participating in research. And the other thing, uh, when you're looking at research, especially uh, with quality improvement projects and patient and health promotion uh, pro research projects, you're sort of challenging the status quo. As humans, we're, we have some degree of being resistant to change. People get very comfortable in their current processes or how they're doing things, but that doesn't mean that's the most efficient way of delivering care. So I think when you're looking at how things are done and you're piecing it apart and you're trying to improve and coming up with ideas to improve current 
models of healthcare and different frameworks, um, you're challenging the status quo, which I think is very important. Um, so when you're conducting research, you're able to do that, which is very valuable. Um, the other thing more relevant to us as PAs, since we are still on the grand scheme of things, a very new profession, I think the more research uh, that we're doing and the more uh, work that we're publishing and the more value we're able to show really is going to add, uh, is going to advocate for our profession. So when our representatives are going to those negotiating meetings to talk about regulating our profession or some of the accreditations and so on and so forth, it would help tremendously to show the value that the PAs have added in many different positions that they've taken on if we have the research and um, publications to show that. So I think if we all do our, uh, little projects to show that we make a difference, uh, we can, it speaks volumes to what we're able to do. What are you changing about your practice as a result of the research you've done? So um, some of the projects that I've done, uh, I've actually implemented them in my clinical day-to-day -day, uh, practice as a PA. And it's the uptake for my projects have been uh, very well to the point that some of the residents are also benefiting from the research that and the and the projects that we've done. So I'll talk about one in particular uh, very briefly. It was uh, setting up home care uh, for our breast surgery patients. So essentially the way it worked is our post-op patients would go home and uh, all of them required drain care and wound care. Uh, but it, it was a bit of a tedious process because everything has to be written out in completion and um, you know, the home care has to be accepted by the home care coordinator and then delivered to the patient at their, at their residence. Um, what we realized, what I realized quite early on is that there was variability in the way that uh, outpatient referral was being set up because the res each resident was doing it in their own way. Um, and some referrals were complete and some were not, and the patients were not being discharged because a referral was incomplete, and there was a lot of... Um, gaps, let's say, uh, in, in doing something that could have been pretty routine because we would discharge patients with that care all the time. So what I took from there uh, was how could I actually make this more efficient? How could I routinize the care that we provide to these patients? So I created uh, these uh, template protocols um, for our CCSC home care specialists, essentially talked about what, the, what was needed and in completion. Uh, and it was a template that was approved by the, the staff surgeons and the nurses, as well as the home care. So all of the stakeholders approved on a certain set of templates. Um, so by doing so, when we were able to arrange home care, it was just a matter of a click and a template would pop, pop, pop up, sorry, in completion. So there were no more questions about this is incomplete, the patient can't go home, this is not right. So that was one thing, it was efficient, process of discharging. Secondly, the resident felt this was groundbreaking because in all their hospitals, they were nagged constantly about, you know, this is not done properly and so on and so forth. But now they were able to see the template and they could do it within seconds. Um, and thirdly, and most importantly, the patients benefited because there was no miscommunication about what should be done and everything was there. Um, I think a lot of patients benefited from... Uh, you know, having that care delivered in a systematic way. And it was, it, I think it not only improved uh, patient care, but um, safety-wise, I think it's, it elevated the standards of post-discharge care to a different level. So that's just one example of what I was able to do how, um, successfully and how it's actually implemented in my day-to-day um, -day practice uh, and also helps the residents. Mm -hmm. And how do you balance your work and research with your clinical responsibilities? So that's very challenging. Um, it goes without saying we are doing very many, we're doing many different things uh, throughout the day. And uh, residents, because the Mount Sinai Hospital is an academic center, um, residents come for you know weeks at a time. Um, they barely, you know, it takes a little bit of time for them to get to know the PA and the role. Um, and I'm not sure that. Um, it's apparent to them how much we actually do in terms of research. So um, because they're not, they're not, because they're not aware really of the research that we do, it's hard for me to take time out uh, from my clinical activities and what they're expecting of me 
to be able to free up that time for research. But I'm fortunate to be working with a group of physicians that support uh, my research and are able to advocate uh, to say, you know, Saira needs a few hours set aside where she's going to catch up on some of her projects and that's my protected time. What challenges did you encounter in the beginning of starting research? So I don't come from a research background. Um, so at the very beginning, I was very uncertain and uh, fearful, really, because I had no sense of direction. I didn't know where to begin. Um, you know, we, I did do, I did volunteer for small research projects when I was doing my undergraduate. But when PS school, when I was in PS school, it was such a condensed curriculum that I didn't, I couldn't free up enough time to delve into research at that point. So. Um, very early on, I was just, uh, I didn't know where to begin. So that uncertainty, I think, was very challenging and very challenging to overcome. But I'm fortunate uh, to be working with a group that's, uh, they're very strong leaders in research and they're very, and they, uh, they've supported me uh, and some of the ideas that I brought, that I bring to the table um, in helping me learn and sort of guiding me and mentoring me through my way. Uh, so. I'm very lucky to have um, supportive supervising physicians uh, in that sense. Um, I think one of the other challenges that I encountered early on, and at that point I didn't know that we had a research um, group that consisted of having you know, research coordinators and statisticians within our hospital that could help. Um, I can see that could be a challenge for beginners, uh, finding the collaborators and, and, and and really getting the buy-in for your project. Sometimes finance is, a, is an issue, grants are sometimes difficult to get. So um, I can see how that could be a challenge, although I didn't face that challenge because uh, Mount Sinai had a really good re working research group and uh, we were able to get push for ideas and get funding and um, get them going pretty well. Say you have an idea for a research project. What is your process from initiation to publication? And the first step is identifying what the topic is. What is it that we're researching? What is it that we're going to be designing a study around or, um, or reviewing literature or what have you? So identifying that topic is the first one. Um, because most of my projects are along QI, pro, uh, quality improvement projects, I'm a little bit biased, so I have a bit of an algorithm on how I like to do things or how I like to approach research projects. I think the next step after that is to gather some background information, um, and that could be sort of looking at your baseline data that you'd like to be able to compare to, um, or doing literature review and seeing what else is out there, what other people have published along the same lines as your idea. Um, gathering data can be difficult, especially if you're working in a hospital, you don't know who to approach, and there's a whole bunch of levels that you have to go through to get some uh, EMR data that may be more accessible in other settings. My next step is usually to brainstorm ideas. So, um, you know, what is it that, how do I want to approach the issue at hand? You know, what, um, how can different studies be designed and which one's the most efficient and pra pragmatic really? Um, so, you know, doing some brainstorming around that. Um, also, I think it's important to identify stakeholders. And, you know, it, are patients involved? And if so, you may need to get an approval from uh, Research Ethics Board. Um, you know, if it's just, uh, if it's charts review, what is it that's uh, involved? So identifying who, which, what are the key players in your research uh, will help sort of navigate um, and come up with uh, a research working group in who it is that you need to include in your research meetings and how to um, move your ideas forward. The next step is uh, once I have all this information, my topic is very clear, I've done some background work, I sort of have an idea on the process uh, and I know the people that are involved then I, and it, then I design a study protocol. So in the protocol um, I'm very clear about sort of the thesis, what is our main goal, the relevance of the uh, project at hand, you know, you, you clearly state your methods, your outcomes, um, your anticipated results, just so you have a reference frame to go back to because it, you know, sometimes what, when you get too bogged down in actually collecting data and doing the research, you lose track of the bigger picture. So it's a nice way to write everything out and creating that protocol so you can refer back to it and see if you're really on track or not. Um, the other thing I think helps if you do this early on is to come up with a data abstraction form. So it's a way of you know collecting all of your raw data. So it's encrypted or protected if there's patient information. Um, 
but also it's a it's a it's a central way or a master sheet uh, where you can plot your raw, raw data for you to review later on. So I think if you have all of your tools in place first, um, it makes it that much easier to carry out, carry out the research once you're actually doing the project. The next step is executing, actually doing the project. And the last step is the publishing or whether it's by a, a form of doing a poster or a paper um, or a presentation. I think um, once you've, you know, you, once you've, um, finish the project and you've looked at your results and you have you've drawn some conclusions then you can present it in any which way uh, you you prefer really so what ways can beginners get started with research some of the ways that uh, beginners can get started in research is by looking at the peer role itself I think if we're if we dissect the peer role there are some really good research ideas you can get from there so for example we know that PAs increase access to health care in primary care or any, any uh, um, setting actually, but um, we know that they increase access to healthcare, reduce wait times, uh, reduce physician burnout, and many other positive qualities that we're able to um, offer uh, as a result of being a PA. So I think if we were even to look at some of those and dissecting that and designing a research project around that topic, I think it's very valuable. So for example, if, uh, if you want to talk about, let's say, reduced wait times, and as a PA in primary care, if you're gathering data and keeping uh, track of the patients you see, uh, then and 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 then you can compare it to some of the baseline data that the EMR may have may have or the clinic can provide you. I think that's a pretty solid research project, and it speaks volumes because it you know when once you publish it and you're able to show that the value you added to that particular setting um, is is very powerful. Some of the ways that existing PAs can uh, get into research would be uh, maybe from their workflow itself. So, for example, you know, we all face uh, sometimes in our, whether we're in clinic or operating room or the ward or wherever it is that we're practicing, sometimes we think, gee, I wish I could make this better. I wish, you know, um, our, this current framework could be modified to avoid um, this lag or you know I wish that I could improve patient outcomes for X Y and Z like whatever it is that the problem is that you're faced with which we all are in everyday practice I think if we capitalize on those moments and those ideas they can be pretty good research projects um, so just to give an example going back to my the current project we're doing for our breast surgery patients we realized you know a lot of these women that were uh, already very anxious about their diagnosis they've just had a surgery now there's uh, you know worried at home about this drain that's not draining and things are getting worse and it's painful and the swelling is increasing you know for me that was an aha moment to say I wish I could change that for them or I wish the outcomes could be different or that they wouldn't have to, after everything they've been through, chemo and what have you, I wish that they wouldn't have to suffer with this minor issue at home. So uh, capitalizing on that and designing a, uh, a project or even just, you know, bouncing ideas off of your coworkers or the physicians you work with uh, to see and brainstorming, going back to my algorithm, to see how is it that you can uh, uh, improve that. I think those, those uh, projects that you're faced with and you're motivated uh, to try to fix and, and overcome some of those challenges, I think those are pretty good research projects as well. And how can PA students incorporate research during school? Uh, I think there are a number of ways that uh, PA students can get involved in research. One of them, um, and with the opportunity present, I think is if, if you see a supervising position or someone that you're shadowing that's doing research and you like to volunteer or you have the opportunity to sort of uh, participate in existing researching projects, uh, I think it's a very good way of, you know, getting your foot in the door. And for, for somebody like me who does not have a research background uh, in my academic career, in my, in my academic years, um, that's, that sense of fear or uncertainty might be lifted since you've seen a research project or a trial being performed, um, you know, very up close. So I think that can help uh, and, and it can also just, you know, make you feel more confident and motivated um, in wanting to do research in your, once you're a practicing PA. So I think that is valuable and also uh, 
now that we have JCANPA, which is going to be a great platform where all, we're all going to publish and, and learn from each other's research, I think uh, you know, staying up to date with what's uh, happening in the PA world and also in the, you know, where, which, where, what are the topics being investigated and where the research projects are, whether staying up to date with the literature, JCANPA, JAPA, what have you, I think uh, the students can, um, they, they can get inspired and uh, it's a good way to sort of uh, stay, you know, be motivated and uh, uh, and learn from whatever's happening, what research, uh, that's not good, not whatever's happening, uh, with uh, the research that's uh, been published. And do you think there's a lot of research uh, that PAs in Canada right now? There is not, but I'm confident that, uh, I'm optimistic that it's, uh, it's emerging. You know, that research rule that unfortunately is not built into the um, our training currently. I think uh, with more and more PAs understanding and learning the value of research and what it does for our profession and for our everyday jobs, uh, I think, you know, as more PAs are being inspired by that, more research is being done. Um, so I think it's emerging. I think, I think we're changing and we're, um, you know, Hopefully the students are being inspired, especially when you come to the conference and you see all the research work that everybody's done, which is phenomenal. Um, I think definitely we're on the path to adding more to um, our, our research and publications. Um, I truly believe that we're all capable of it. I think we're, you know, we're professionals, we're a very smart uh, group of individuals uh, that you know, have each has a lot to offer. Um, and uh, now I'm optimistic that uh, there's definitely more research that uh, is coming down the pipeline. Excellent. And what are your future directions in research? So I see myself as a health advocate and my projects, uh, I'm biased because a lot of my projects are, are, are along the lines of health promotions and quality improvement. So I think I'm going to continue um, doing those. There are, uh, I'm always open and I'm always looking for ideas and opportunities to improve the current uh, system and the current processes. Um, so, and I enjoy it. So I think I'm gonna continue and I'm gonna, I'm hoping to publish more and and um, write more for the PA journals and uh, hoping to bring new projects and new ideas to the conference next year.